this week's drive, we get up to speed with some new software. Swing low in a sweet new chariot. Say sorry for some on-track contact. And see where art meets muscle and horsepower. All this and more in this week's Drive. As we sit down to enjoy a day's racing, spare a thought for what's involved in making it all happen. In the space of the eight-month racing season, the Formula One caravan makes its way to 17 racing venues on four continents. But to get there, and to countless testing sessions, the teams have to cover about 150,000 kilometers each year by air, sea and road, taking along as much as they can and nothing more than they need. The logistics involved are enormous. And it's not only the cars, engines and spare parts. It's also a pretty big job to sort out everything for the pit you're planning to use. In other words, there's now as much backup kit around it as there is on the car itself. And then there's a complete test team. That means everything I send to the race, I also have to send somewhere else in the world for testing. So it's all doubled. For the teams, it's a race between races. To set up the garage so that everyone knows where everything is takes a full day to get all the electrics installed and all the tools and equipment stowed away. Up to 8,000 individual parts and tools require a high level of logistical skill from each of the teams. It's like a big jigsaw puzzle, and none of the parts can be left out or left over. There's a strict timetable, and everything has to be in place on time. For the first race, it takes nearly a month to get all the new equipment to be ready for the first flyaway. When we're into the season, it normally takes about a week to have... Uh, we, we take 26 tonnes of equipment to each flyaway race. Packing and unpacking 26 tonnes of gear can only be done with a strict checklist and with a routine that would make an army drill sergeant proud. Everything is carried, to the European rounds at least, in a fleet of high-tech trucks. There is everything in there. Food, parts for the car, enough spares to build probably another eight cars and all the equipment we need to run the garage when we're at a race meeting. Even washing the trucks is important. After all, the sponsors spend a lot of money and they want their image to be looked after too. For the distant races, known as flyaways, all the equipment is packed into regulation-sized containers and airlifted by a fleet of specially equipped cargo planes. Between them, a Formula One grid can get through 700 tyres in one weekend, so everyone needs to keep their wits about them when transporting an entire team to the other side of the world. Everything has to go into boxes, and then everything has to be itemised. But on a European race, the three trucks behind me are crammed full of spares. There, there tends to be more on the trucks than what we take to a flyaway race. It's much easier for us in Europe, because we come back from one race just to replenish it, and then we go on to the next one. But on a flyaway race, we have to send all the way back to England for any spares that we do need. At BMW Williams, over 100 people actively work for the team's success. After a long day, the work may be done for the driver, but it's far from finished for the rest of his team. Whether it's a race or a test session, everything has to be cleaned, cleared up and packed away. The cars and the rest of the equipment. And of course, trade secrets need to be protected from prying rival eyes too. But the work's not over. When they get back, there's all the mechanical work on each car to be done too. Repairs, upgrades and tuning ahead of the next race. So, a look behind the scenes shows that the business of logistics has a lot to do with logic, and that in Formula One, it's not just the cars that need to be handled with speed and perfection. Computers are used increasingly in motorsport to make the cars faster, but now the teams are using technology to help engineers save time. Chip Ganassi Racing uses Sintel's software to help engineers share information quickly and reduce car setup time. 
course, Intel has uh, provided the programming uh, support um, uh, to help develop the digital documentation system that we're using. An extra dimension has been added up and down pit lane. It allows our engineers to record the setup changes that they're making on the race cars. Up until this point, the engineer had always recorded this information uh, in a traditional pen and paper method. Um, this piece of software um, um, and in combination with a tablet PC allows the engineer to record these setup changes during a session and have that information readily accessible uh, for other team members uh, and in our situation particularly for um, the other driver and his engineer. The quicker a team can give a driver a car which is near to ideal, the more time he has to make the final adjustments that will help put him on pole position. Another application that we use, which is a Microsoft product, uh, it is their um, live communications. Um, it is an instant messaging application. So it allows us on tablets and using laptops to have an instant messaging conversation between the two pit stands. I can type stuff in on my tablet. Bill Pappas, the other engineer on the other car, can read what we're doing on Scott's car and he can analyse that and see whether it's worth trying on Darren. Similarly, I can get info off him all the time. During the races, that aspect also works because we can see what's going on with each car, how we're running, whether someone did something that helped. That's a pretty good idea. Uh, while we're working in a practice session or a qualifying session, it's very useful to have that database of information we can call back on and it's all in the same format. What we used to do years ago, we used to have Excel sheets and all that kind of thing. They're always subtly different, they're not stored in, a, in the same database that's easily accessible. Uh, obviously us race engineers knew how to access it but it was tough for other people to just drop in. Now we have the application throughout the company, everybody knows you can just log on get the information you need at any time, it's all in the same format, everyone understands it. Traditionally, teams have relied on historical data from previous years and a few practice sessions to get the car set up for each event. But now, teammates can have access to each other's setup data electronically. Uh, we had a situation last year in Pikes Peak where, uh, due to a very rare mechanical failure, Scott Dixon actually uh, missed out on track time during the final practice uh, before the race. His engineer was then able to use the trackside application to review data from the teammate, Thomas Schechter, and his engineer uh, to help make some decisions for final fine-tuning for the race. Scott ended up winning Pikes Peak last year, uh, so we're very, very happy with, uh, uh, with what the application was able to provide us. Data from the car is transmitted back to the pits during testing, practice and the race. We go talk to every engineer in the entire pit uh, area and th their response is unanimous of, I can't believe that we've been able to work without this thing for this many years and been and as successful as we have been. So, uh, you know, quantitatively, that's our next step is to try to try to figure out exactly how to measure that. You know, you know, if you look at maybe the amount of time it takes to set up the car over the course of the weekend, you know, when the car comes off the truck, there's a there's an amount of time where it takes to figure out you know how you need to set up the car differently for that specific track mm -hmm. and then go with it well if we have all that data at our fingertips and easily downloadable and easily manipulated mm -hmm. to to temperature settings of the air temperature track temperature what have you mm -hmm. um, you know setup of the car becomes that much less important and it's, let's get on the track and make it work Ever since the original 6 Series BMW was first seen on the road, enthusiasts have hoped for a convertible version. Well, the wait is over. The all-new 6 Series convertible was launched earlier this year, and it's appearing in various markets around the world. Drop-dead gorgeous looks, state-of-the-art technology, outstanding performance and huge driving pleasure with only the blue sky above await the four lucky occupants. The 645CI is first and foremost a BMW, so generous poise and performance comes standard. It shares its high-tech 4.4-litre V8 with the 645CI Coupe. 
the engine offers variability of virtually all engine parameters such as valve timing, valve lift and intake manifold length to maximize performance. Driving through one of three six-speed transmissions, a conventional manual, Steptronic Auto or a Formula One inspired sequential manual gearbox, the new convertible will reach an electronically limited top speed of 250 kilometers an hour. Unique to the 6 Series are special high-tech thermoplastic front mudguards, aluminium doors and a new lightweight material used for the boot lid, which incorporates a lip spoiler. Both composites offer the same properties as steel and aluminium, but are easier to shape. Standard are adaptive bi-xenon headlights that see round corners and 18-inch alloy wheels fitted with run-flat tyres that have a 150km range uninflated, backed by a tyre pressure warning system. Comfort features include pearl leather sports seats, heated and electrically adjustable with three memory settings for both front occupants. A TV and satellite navigation with large format screen, voice recognition for iDrive controls, in-car phone, glove box mounted six stacker CD changer and a top quality sound system are all included. Thanks to additional bracing, a beefier front subframe, a strengthened windscreen frame and pop-up rear roll bars, among other things, the convertible weighs in about 200 kilos heavier than the coupe, easily bursting past the two-ton mark. Except for seat belts built into the front seats, the convertible's interior is practically indistinguishable from the coupe's, and even with the self-folding roof stowed and all the windows down, there's little wind buffeting. Inside, the car offers the expected high levels of luxury and driver-involving features. There's a standard DVD-based onboard navigation system. This system is controlled, along with the sound system and other features, by BMW's contentious iDrive, a console-mounted knob that works like a computer mouse to select from about 700 different functions and commands. Head-up display is available as an option. It projects important driving information directly into the driver's line of vision. The soft top raises in a matter of seconds from beneath the firm cover behind the passenger compartment. The driver is able to open or close it from the cockpit simply by pressing a button or turning the key in the door lock. It can even be done while driving at below 30 kilometers an hour in stop and go traffic. It takes about 26 seconds to raise the roof and about 24 to lower it. The newly developed roof on the 6 Series convertible mirrors the look of the coupe. It dampens exterior noise just as effectively as it shields from the wind and the weather, with a noise and heat insulating layer of plastic between the rubberized outer layer and the inner lining, giving low noise levels within the convertible, allowing conversation at high speed. Mechanically, the convertible is identical to the coupe and uses the suspension from the 5 Series. BMW's new 6 Series successfully revives the legend of the CSI with the 645 CI. The price of the new car starts at €72,000 in Germany. Here's a very upmarket one-make series of racing, a seven-event series on prestigious European circuits, driving the Maserati Trofeo, the car derived from the Coupe Cambio Corsa road car. It's an international showcase combined with other top-level motorsport events from the GT Championship to Formula One. We have 25 to 26 cars on the starting grid. This year's formula is the same as last year's. The cars have been modified a little bit, essentially on the bodywork. The rear wing was improved in order to give more downforce. From the mechanical point of view, the cars are similar. For next year, we have already scheduled some modifications, but the car's success in 2003 was so big that we wanted to keep it the same. The Maserati Trophy gives the gentleman driver the privilege of arriving at the racetrack to find a car waiting for him in perfect condition with his own mechanic and race engineer and all arrangements already made, even including clothing. More than 60% of the 2003 season drivers decided to come back in 2004. I think that they found in the trophy what they were looking for, and that means they're satisfied with what we provide them. We are very happy with the results we obtained from our international media plan. The trophy is now well known all around Europe. Each trophy event takes place over three days, Friday, Saturday and Sunday. Friday and Saturday are practice sessions and qualifying rounds with the race itself on Sunday, organized as a mini endurance event with a compulsory pit stop. 
The big news about the trophy in 2004 is that the competition will go to South America. It's very important for us. 28 cars will race in a South American championship. We are also attempting to create a Central American trophy, and it will perhaps take place in 2005. And why not also in the US? We would love it. The package includes entry to the championship, insurance, use of a car for the race weekend, tires and fuel, parts and labor, a factory trained mechanic at every race, a chief mechanic for every six cars, accommodation for the driver and a companion, race kit, that's overalls, boots and so on, and even the use of a spare car if one is available where crash damage can't be repaired in time. Diego Alessi in car 16 started from pole and was able to fend off Alberto Chirai's early attacks. Behind them, Roman driver Andrea Palmer in car 51 had swept past Hans Notter and was leaving him trailing. Coming next was a pack in which Maurizio Fabris, Sergio Rotta, Alberto Vescovi, Benedetto Amati and Andrea De Magni were furiously swapping position. The battle for fifth was intense. On lap five, Rotta brushed into Fabris, who in turn collided with Notta, causing him to spin. This is why it's called gentleman's racing. Cars make contact and drivers apologize. But race officials hit Rotter with a stop and go penalty for his role in the incident on lap five. And while he was out of the action, Romani and Ferrari pulled out too. Lap 13 saw Alessi hold a commanding seven second lead from Chirai. De Palma was piling on the pressure and was three seconds down on him. The superb Vescovi followed with Amati, Domani and Petrini hot on his heels. Drivers began to make their pit stops from lap 15. This year, the teams have to make a 90-second pit stop to change driver. Francesco Ravasio, Alessi's teammate, was suited up and waiting for the car to pit. As a result, Chirai inherited the lead, staying out as other drivers stopped too. But Palmer's car was looming even bigger in his mirrors. Taking advantage of the stops going on around him, Albert Turn und Taxis climbed into a respectable third. Eventually, Chirai came into the pits for his obligatory stop, but was able to get back out again with his lead intact. He found himself holding a slender lead from Ravazio and Palmer. Palmer swept past Ravazio, unless he's substitute, and set off after Chirai. The pass came on lap 22, Palmer cruising past on the inside. With a clean track in front of him, the Roman opened up a sizable gap. But Chirai was having electrical trouble under the dashboard of his car. He lost concentration and a lot of time and was passed by Ravazio. Further back, there was a furious fight between Andrea de Menyi and Max Cattori, with Cattori eventually emerging in front. Chirai was still being distracted by his technical problem and Palmer was able to close up and attack at every opportunity. Eventually, Chirai made a mistake, slid wide and left a gap open for Palmer, who pounced and slipped past on the inside. again as the car hits the curb and the driver lets the wheels spin and correct itself as he loses a place to his rival. Max Cattori in car four was the key player in this phase of the race. First he closed the gap that separated him from Marco Lambertini and then passed him with an attack on the inside of the hairpin. The Swiss driver then set off to chase Chirai, catching his prey after only a few laps and claiming second place. Leader Palmer had a 14-second cushion over Cattori and a whole lot more over Chirai, Lambertini, De Magni and Ravazio. The thrills were not over just yet. Lambertini was struggling with Chirai for third spot with a place on the podium up for grabs. The debutant could not afford to let up as De Magni was less than a second behind him. On lap 29 and with Palmer having slowed a little to reduce the risk of making any mistakes, Lambertini finally managed to overhaul Chirai. It was now Chirai's turn to keep Demani at bay, and he was able to do this just at the chequered flag. He held an advantage of only one-tenth of a second. 
For me, it's a dream come true. I wanted to win my home race, but I couldn't imagine it was possible. It's very satisfying in front of my friends and family. For me, it's fantastic. So it was a superb win for Andrea Palmer. Behind him on the podium finished Notta and Cattori and Marco Lambertini. Female ex-Formula One driver Giovanna Amati finished eighth. And in case you need to know, the cost of competing in the whole season is €123,000, plus tax and legal charges, of course. Recently, 12,000 Harley-Davidson motorcycle riders descended on the German port city of Hamburg to admire each other's favourite toys, swap parts and stories, to see and be seen. According to police, 90,000 people attended the meeting at Hamburg Harbour recently, the second such event which saw participants coming from across Europe. Thousands of Harley enthusiasts held the first Hamburg meeting last year on the occasion of the American bike manufacturer's 100th birthday. According to the Harley-Davidson factory, in 1903, 23-year-old William S. Harley and 20-year-old Arthur Davidson made available to the public the first production Harley-Davidson motorcycle. The bike was built to be a racer, with a three and an eighth inch bore and a three and a half inch stroke. The factory in which they worked was a 10 by 15 foot wooden shed with the words Harley-Davidson Motor Company crudely scrawled on the door. Arthur's brother Walter soon resigned from his job in Kansas and joined the fledgling factory. The brand has survived to become one of the world's oldest manufacturers, and for a while, Harley was the only motorcycle manufactured in America. There is only one motorbike, and that's the Harley. As one Harley fan in Hamburg explained, the reputation of his favourite motorbike 70 years on was not the best and hence it was difficult to get parts in Europe. I have had this bike on the road since 1976 and have done 276,000 kilometres during that time. I've had my silver wedding anniversary with it, something I have never managed with a woman. It always remained faithful to me. At the time it was very difficult getting parts in Europe because Harleys did not have the best reputation. On top of that, Harley was close to bankruptcy. If we wanted to get parts, we flew over to Miami to shop at Phil Patterson's. We left everything we brought with us in Miami, shoes, everything, and returned home with tons of luggage, like tools. Most Harleys are cruisers, but the factory does produce a few sportier bikes, and a local stunt rider did things no Harley rider would have thought possible. There are stunts which look pretty easy, but are in fact rather difficult. But if you practice enough, you can manage the impossible. For many years, the heart of the Harley design has been a large capacity air-cooled V-twin engine, which has grown in size and with occasional technical updates. Most Harleys are big, heavy bikes, which are like a blank canvas for the art form of motorcycle customizers. Popular with outlaw biker clubs around the world, Harleys are expensive, often stolen, and offer much less in the way of performance and handling than rival brands from Europe and Japan. But they make up for it in character, charisma, and style, and they are highly prized by riders who prefer form over function. Harley's brilliant marketing has made their famous logo an icon for freedom, rebellion, and individualism, even if many of the bikes and their riders do end up looking very much the same. So, whether you're just packing up and moving on, seeing what new software can do, or just out for a ride, so you stay on track and up to speed, make sure you catch next week's Drive.